long he's like been in the game. And I just, I don't know when I first met him, have you ever met one of your idols before? Um, like movie stars and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So like for me, Zuko was like the equivalent of that. So when I first met him, my like jaw dropped, it was in LA and I didn't realize he was that he's pretty tall. Um, okay. He's pretty tall. So that kind of took me back. I, I, for whatever reason, pictured him as like shorter. And then like, I met him and he was like super nice. And we dove into like decentralized governance for like two hours. Just talked about, it was really cool. So awesome. but yeah, JW, thanks for hopping on the first rendition of, I haven't named it yet. I was going to call it Z to Z pod. The first, one? the first one. Wow. All right, man. Yeah. And I thought you'd be a perfect guest to have on because you come from, you know, obviously doing a lot of great work on the regulatory side of things and just supporting Zcash um, from like your regulatory work. And then also just like as a, as just a general supporter of it. So I thought like, it'd be interesting to get your perspective on everything that's going on. Cause I think sometimes people, and I don't know, maybe people working in a dev fund at one of the three orgs can have a different view than maybe people from outside the dev fund. So I thought this could be a really interesting thing, an interesting conversation. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I haven't named it yet. So right now it's Z to Z podcast, but I'm not, I don't want it to just be Z cash people. I'd like to get tons of people because I think tons of different protocols and everything care about privacy. So I'll, I'll get the name down later. But how have you been today? How's it, how's everything going? You had a big, uh, I guess we can get right into it. You had a, you had a big um, op-ed come out on the Wall Street Journal. Can Let's just dive into that and tell me the reaction was great. Brian Armstrong from Coinbase tweeted it out. Like, tell me, tell me how oh, you're I feeling. Oh, I didn't see that. He did? He, he did? Yeah, he tweeted it. He just tweeted the article, like just tweeted the op-ed. And I was like, I, and I saw yeah. it and I was like, I was like, I was like, go JW. That's awesome. So tell me more about that and, and kind of inspiration for it. And, and for people who haven't read it, just a high level overview of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I did a little op-ed in the Wall Street Journal today. I'm really excited about it. Uh, I, uh, you know, tweeted it to all my friends, including people who have no interest in finance or crypto or anything. So I tweeted everyone, uh, including my mom and dad. You know, my mom and dad were like, we're really proud of you. We don't really understand it, but very proud. Um, so, yeah, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, it's hard to get things, things placed there. I do a lot of op-ed work, a lot of a lot of technical journal writing for securities and banking law, but I also do some op-ed work, some popular writing. Uh, so I do a lot of op-eds, but the Wall Street Journal is like, uh, it's really hard to crack. So the last one I did for the journal was 10 years ago. So thank you, crypto. I love crypto. It's a great opportunity to get back in there. And it's just an article about how, um, and crypto community knows this, the design of crypto projects does not meet in the box of what is a security and must register, the good old Howey test, everybody's favorite test. Um, so the SEC is is kind of spraying all kinds of tokens, very irresponsibly, I think, um, at, and claiming their securities. I'm really frustrated with the delisting of AMP. I, I, I understand it, and I knew it was coming this year. I knew that would be the first threat we'd face, would be delistings. De uh, AMP is such a great project, such a cool project, and yet, you know, being delisted from Binance just because it was named in the insider trading case, it really makes me wrong. And that was probably my inspiration of it, uh, for, for why I, I thought, let me do an op-ed, because... Um, really excited about that project. You know, I use Flex. I use, uh, I try not to spend too much on Zcash because I'm more of a Zodler. But, uh, uh, you know, every once in a while I'll spend some using Flexa, Sped, and App. And AMP is the collateral token that makes that possible. Um, so much utility in that token. It's so much unlike a security. Um, and let's be honest, you know, I wouldn't stand here and defend, like, everything Coinbase has listed in this last six months. They've listed some stuff that, eh, not necessarily a great investment. But to throw AMP in that list really makes me raw and such a great project and, and so much potential for the future of widespread crypto adoption. They've already got a lot of great retail chains uh, using it. So I thought, let me write an op-ed. This is all I can do right now is do an op-ed. Um, and I guess I was so mad about that that uh, it turns out the writing was okay and caught the journal's attention. Yeah, so it was good. And I told a story about using AMP uh, to buy burrito, how you can, you know, I could use tokens in Uniswap and Yearn to buy a burrito using using AMP as the intermediary token through Flexa. Um, so it was like, you know, is it a security really? Because I just bought a burrito with it. So how is that possible? You know, it was kind of, yeah. kind of the theme in there. Um, and I did actually do it. I, this week I made sure that, that I 
bought a burrito using uni and urine tokens. It worked. Uh, although, to be honest, when I got to uh, Capotole, the guy was like, what? Flexa? I was like, yeah, 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 you guys take it. He's like, no, 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 we don't take it. Said, no, 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 you do actually take it. Watch. So I had to teach the clerk how to use it. But um, got a delicious burrito with some guacamole and uh, root beer with my uh, with my securities um, and made a, made an op-ed out of it. So. Oh, I want to I want to touch on something you just said, just from a writing perspective. You said that the situation made you mad. And I've heard that the best time to write is when is when you're mad. Like if, if someone, if, if you're suffering from writer's block, people say like, just write about what makes, makes you mad and then edit it later. Tell me more about like, cause it was a relatively quick turnaround to get this out. Like I remember the news broke within, I think the last two to three weeks. And then you tweeted out that I'm writing an op-ed for the wall street journal. And then, and then very, very quickly after this came out. So just walk me through the process of, of getting all of this done and, and how this ended up in the wall street journal. Um, you know, I think I've, I've, um, I say you got to do something a few hundred times before you get good at it. That's definitely true because I really sucked at this when I first tried to do it. Um, an op-ed is 750 words. It's got to be very precise. It's about eight paragraphs. The sentences need to be short, punchy to the point, and really distill complicated topics into something very simple for a fifth grade reader. I mean, crypto, that's not easy. Uh, and securities law and crypto, um, but I've been doing this a long time, and uh, it's it's something that 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 I've honed by just writing a lot of these. So I wrote it pretty quickly. I wrote it in about an hour, um, and uh, and shipped it off, and and you know it, it, it worked out. It was a lucky break, but it's, it's hard to replicate with a big something like the journal like that. I do most of my work in in venues like the Hill, a few in the Washington Post, um, and uh, uh, a lot of them in real clear policy, real clear politics, Bloomberg. Law 316, some of the law uh, focus trades, Bloomberg Law. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it, it's fun. And and uh, you mentioned the book. I'm, I'm, so I'm doing a privacy book, crypto privacy book. And, uh, you know, this is my first book. I've done a lot of academic articles. I've done a lot of op-eds. Uh, this is the first book. So it's, uh, it's kind of imposing. But I've, I'm at the stage of I've got the book proposal, about an 80-page book proposal. Uh, it's benefited from some great comp feedback from – from Zuko and from a lot of folks in the crypto private, different crypto privacy communities. Uh, but Zuko has been very, so generous with his time and his thoughts. And um, uh, anyway, it looks like I'm, I'm going to get it done. I don't have an offer yet, but I do have an agent yeah. and uh, I have talked to MIT press, which is good for an academic press. And they want it to go through peer review. It's not an offer yet. But it's kind of like, as long as you, you know, keep at it through the peer review, uh, Odds look pretty good for, for I think, an MIT Press book, um, which is good because they've done some good crypto books in the past. Um, and uh, there aren't many good ones. You know, most of them are junk. They're kind of like how to get rich with crypto and just the trash. But there are a few really good ones. And, and most of those have been have been uh, uh, a couple of those have been from MIT Press. So I'm excited to explore that possibility. Um, I'm just excited, excited to do a book about crypto privacy. So with. When you're talking about crypto privacy, are you focusing on imagining focusing on the various protocols and and cryptocurrencies that offer your that a high level user privacy? Zcash, Monero is another good example. Are you focusing on any other projects, um, whether it's like a, a coin join or a tornado cash? Like, what, what projects are you trying to encompass within the book, and then what tr what stories are you trying to tell with the book? So I'm doing three things with the book, three principal things. Um, and two of them are fairly easy and don't really require any expertise from me. The third one is where I think I bring a unique perspective. So first, it's just tell people why privacy matters. Um, and that's kind of describing something that a lot of other people have worked on. Alex Gladstein has done great stuff on this. And um, uh, so why privacy matters and, and just describing these projects and really just distilling what's available in other mediums and up on Medium or in podcasts or whatever and white papers distilling it all for the average reader to kind of learn about um, the stories behind projects. And I think the stories, the story of Zcash is fascinating to me. It's a fascinating story. And that's what I did my sample chapter on. And the MIT Press people really liked it because it's such a cool story. Um, and the story of Monero, which is a cool story, too, with a lot of crazy twists and turns, you know. Um, in terms of teaching people how to use it, um, I want to teach people how to use privacy coins. That's Zcash and Monero. Um, I'll 
talk about others, but none of the others really are, you know, either they're either they don't work well or they don't have enough usage to have a good anonymity set. Um, but I'll talk about a few of them, like Pirate Chain R, which is kind of just funny because of the uh, the coins, uh, the coins of moniker. Um, but now, principally, the stories of crypto privacy coins, Zcash Monero, uh, crypto privacy tech, uh, uh, and, and, and transaction uh, history, you know, cutting mixers, coin join. Uh, and, and there, I want to principally just focus on Samurai and Sparrow Wallet as implementations behind Whirlpool, because as as I've studied this, um, you know, I, I don't I don't want to pick sides unless I'm really sure I can. It seems like in the Samurai versus Wasabi, Samurai won and and Wasabi lost, and that seems to be pretty clear to me. Uh, just just and I first started to follow that part of the privacy story right after the. The news broke about uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Bitfinex hackers uh, uh, being, you know, revealed, or, or at least uh, the the um, just to be specific, the criminal indictment alleging money laundering associated with the hack uh, against uh, Heather and Ilya, um, and uh, you know they used Wasabi Wallet. And at first, the news was like, "Oh no, coin joins have been, you know, chain analysis found a way to see through all the coin joins." Uh, and Samurai was like, whoa, 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 there are problems with Asabi I've phrased a few times. He's got some great YouTube videos about, here's how I can kind of unmask Wasabi transactions. So no doubt the government did too. Uh, and I haven't seen Wasabi with any kind of good retort to that. So anyway, I'll focus on the Samurai and, and, and Sparrow uh, wallets as they connect to CoinJoin and how to use them and how they work. Uh, and then the question of, and th these projects that aren't even really finished yet, but that are emerging, Crypto as a as a layered function, uh, things like Aztec uh, and, and how they work, um, and uh, just teach readers how to use all of those things. And to the extent there are debates, and there are obviously some fierce debates between Monero and Zcash, uh, try to do an objective job of presenting each side's argument. Um, you know, and uh, and uh, since you're a Zcash guy, um, I'll say that I have a lot of respect for Zcash, and that'll come through in the book. And most of the critiques I've seen so far have really been critiques about Zcash pre-Halo, um, uh, or just not liking the design. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who don't like the design of the Dev Fund, which is not really a critique. It's just uh, more of a choice, more of a preference. Um, so I haven't really found a lot of critiques that are that really stick, or that aren't kind of pre-Halo critiques. You know, um, uh, and then, but th but that's all just telling. Sharing information, distilling information, making it useful to the to the normie reader. I think my contribution that's unique is uh, I do, uh, uh, from the perspective of law, from the perspective of forensic accounting, I do both. I'm securities and banking lawyer, professor, consultant, and uh, also a forensic accountant. I do uh, litigation support where I help follow the money, help catch bad guys who commit fraud or steal money, um, and uh, uh, work on... Um, money laundering issues too, usually defense side uh, money laundering cases and, and tax fraud cases. And it's clear to me that this technology is going to upend all of that in a way that, 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 that lawyers and accountants and financial professionals are not even remotely ready for. Uh, so I, I think I can, I can bring some original thinking to that. Um, and, uh, you know, along the way, the, the kind of theme of the book is that, that privacy is important, privacy matters, privacy is a fundamental human right. Um, but just like a lot of other things we have the right to, we have to be responsible in how we use it. And, uh, there will be bad people who do bad things with it the same way they do bad things with gash or with, uh, with cars or with, you know, you could kill somebody with a pencil, right? Um, if it's well sharpened. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are two sides to privacy, just like to everything else. Uh, that doesn't mean ban it. That doesn't mean surveil it or stop it. But, um, along the way, along the book, I'll think about how, how the, how these two, Technologies will be used for good and for ill, uh, and just, just kind of present both sides of the crypto privacy coin in that way. Uh, and, and along the way, talk about some techniques that can help good people maintain their privacy that are also the same kind of techniques that money launderers use. It just happens to be that good privacy techniques are good privacy techniques, right? So focusing on, I think my value added to the book is focusing on that intersection of crypto privacy and fiat, because it's hard to, and, and by the way, I'm backing up a little bit. One of the chapters will also be about 
the notion of circular economies in the Bitcoin world. That's a very important thing. Circular Bitcoin. Use non-KYC Bitcoin and try to live your entire economic life in solely Bitcoin, which is hard. I mean, there are some people that are really hardcore to do it, I think, but it's very hard. So for most people, especially as we transition, I think it's going to be uh, crypto and fiat intersecting with each other. And that's a challenge for privacy because as you go from shielded to fiat or fiat to shielded, um, it's hard to maintain privacy there. I'll explore how you might try to, um, but it's going to be very hard to maintain it in part because uh, you know you can take a transaction and link it to a an unshielding transaction and link it to a shielding transaction as fiat and shield, things, something like shielded Zcash interact with each other. So I'll talk about the techniques that uh, forensic accountants use to do that, how to avoid it if you want to try to avoid it, how people will try to avoid it criminally, how those same techniques can help all of us use it um, legally. Um, you know, and one of the motivations to the book for me, honestly, and, and, and an issue I want to use in my think tank I'm starting. I know I've got too many projects on the, on the, on the brain, but um, one of the things really... No, we, 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 need, we need more of these. We need more yeah, projects yeah. coming out of this. Yeah. One of the <laughs> things that really makes me angry is seeing all of these cases where there's something that went wrong in crypto. And maybe there's a bad person that did a bad thing. Maybe there's a hacker. Maybe there's an embezzlement. Um, maybe there's some insider trading. Or maybe there's just a violation of company policies, but it's not insider trading. Whatever. Somebody, even if you grant they did a bad thing, I see U.S. attorneys tacking on a money laundering charge, like like can like throwing out candy on all and it's just about every crypto indictment, indictment, just because they also use some kind of a privacy technology. Now that's a real threat to me. And I've even heard U.S. attorneys say in, in speeches about this that to use a mixer is illegal. Now, first of all, that's an inaccurate statement about the law. Money laundering is only a crime if there's a precursor crime to the money laundering, another crime. If you haven't committed some other crime, there's no way money laundering uh, even 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 uh, attaches. Uh, so it's just an inaccurate statement of law. But that worries me a little bit that there's that there's you know that 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 that, that we slowly move toward a world in which use of crypto privacy technologies is deemed suspect uh, and that you have to justify its use. That worries me a lot. So that's that's another reason, another motivation for me in, in writing this book and, and where I can add some contributions as a banking lawyer, law professor um, to the crypto space where mm -hmm. I'm not an expert, I'm more of a lay student, but very eager student with this technology. So that's all kind of what's wrapped around in this book. Um, I have, I'm not sure I have a title yet, kind of like you're working on a, uh, uh, <clears throat> title for the podcast, something the podcast. like how to hide money with crypto, um, something like that. The two faces of crypto privacy, whatever. Um, still got to work on that. Still got to finish. The do, book, but do you, do you think that this narrative of like that, that statement you just made, and I, I have a thousand questions, but want to focus here first, that statement you just made with using a mixer is illegal. That is while not, factually correct, that is a perception that a lot of people might have or a perception that people are trying to put forward. Do you think there is a situation where there will be a war on crypto privacy? And if there is, what steps can organizations and protocols and things of that nature take to make that, um, take to either prevent that or, or fight against that when that moment comes? Yeah, well, um, you know, we have to watch and see what the Treasury Department does with the travel rule. So the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury spoke at consensus this year. And he didn't really tell us much. But he said, we're looking at the the, you know, the midnight rulemaking that the Trump administration tried to do on the way out, that Mnuchin tried to do on the way out, uh, to require kind of a European style, require, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do they call it? Unhosted wallets, which just means my wallet, right? This pejorative term that uh, that uh, I think is ridiculous. Um, they might think about reviving that rulemaking. We're not sure what they're going to do. Um, the war is uh, you know, partly a litigation fight. I really salute Coin Center in the the litigation they're bringing against uh, a related rule that Treasury has to require reporting of ten thousand dollar crypto transactions to Treasury. Um, <clears throat> they're suing on constitutional grounds, and I'm I salute them in that. That's 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 Lord's work uh, that they're doing there. That'll be a, uh, a a field where we need to fight on crypto privacy. 
and part of this organization, this think tank I'm trying to start, uh, is <clears throat> inspired by Coin Center and wants to do the same thing Coin Center does. Just, just you know, lawsuits they might consider but pass up. I'll take them. I'll take them up. Uh, and uh, so that's why I'm starting that. Uh, you know, Peter Van Valkenburg has got some great work, and you should bring him on your show. He's terrific. Um, I guess he's on the board of uh, the Zcast Foundation, so he'll probably. I'm be gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to steal his time when I when we're in Vegas this weekend. Okay, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. that's great. That's great. I should have gone. <laughs> yeah, Zcon's Z- Z- up this weekend, and I, I believe he's on a panel, so I'm gonna try and try and try and make that, trying to get, trying to get that asking somehow. But yeah, uh, yeah. Well, he's got. Yeah, some- I really. Re- Really respects a lot of the work he's doing. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Uh, he's got some great thinking on um, on what's going to happen with the third party doctrine. Uh, this this old doctrine that kind of undergirds AMLBSA, and that once you put your money in the bank, you give up your privacy, and the bank gets to decide what to do with your information to some extent uh, as it interacts with the government. Um, uh, there are some limitations, but at least with suspicious activity reports and mandatory reports, um, <clears throat> you give up a ton of privacy. Uh, but he thinks that the third party doctrine may be in the wane with Justice Gorsuch and maybe some of the new other new justices. Um, so maybe that's a fight to bring up. Maybe that's a fight that, where they'll sue and where I'd love to help him sue in as well. Um, so that'll be one one um, one battleground. Uh, the other one is just the surreptitious delistings. Um, you know, I know privacy coins have had to deal with this uh, uh, in Japan and Asia. Uh and uh, that's something to keep an eye on. But it obviously probably benefits Zcash that that, that uh, you can do uh, transparent transactions too. Uh, that'll probably always be a benefit. Well, that yeah, that's what Brian uh, Brian Armstrong on Lex Lex Fredman's podcast brought that up. Brought the fact that you can have viewing keys on Zcash is one of the reasons that um, that the exchange adopted it and allows allows people to purchase it. Yeah, and I was glad to see a centralized exchange guy so pro privacy, you know, kind of like the Kraken guys. I love to see it because it means, you know, they haven't they haven't sold out yet. Yeah. Do you think that this again with the wallet like the the unhosted wallet and the self custody, the war, the potential regulations against that, do you find that there's a similarity between that and this potential move to CBDCs? in an effort, in my opinion, to remove cash from society and essentially create a full-on surveillance state of money. Do you think that the war on self-custody, the potential regulation, war is a strong word, but potential regulations on self-custody, some that are happening in the European Union, do you, do you think that there's a similar fight or similar regulation towards cash in the near future? Do you see that happening where people are going to try and eliminate paper cash? Uh, yeah, those are all related. Uh, I think some of the same people, your kind of Christine Lagarde folks um, who support a CBDC or are exploring it, uh, for the, do so for the same reason that they're suspicious of private wallets. Um, uh, hopefully all this means, even if we adopt European-style regulation, which I hope we don't, but hopefully all it means is I withdraw from Coinbase to one wallet that's doxed and then just immediately do it to a second wallet that's not doxed. Uh, and shield it there. I guess it just means I have to have an intermediary docs wallet, but let's hope we don't have to deal with that uh, even. Um, uh, so yeah, some of the same people support those two things for the same reason. The war on cash is kind of old uh, and, and was predated crypto. Uh, maybe not totally predated, but it happened before crypto became a part of that conversation, it was big enough for, for central bankers to care about. Um, so that you know, we saw the results of the Elimination of large dollar denominations in India. Uh, it was a disastrous implementation. <clears throat> and there's been efforts to get rid of the $100 bill in the United States. Not to get rid of cash completely, but to get rid of the $100 bill. <clears throat> because ostensibly it makes it harder to do, you know, bad things. Um, makes it harder to do a lot of things. Uh, but uh, that hasn't gone, it hasn't gained traction yet. But there are a lot of people that I think supported it. There was one, I forget his name, one MIT econ professor maybe that was supportive of eliminating the hundred dollar bill but hopefully soon enough uh you know cash won't matter we'll we'll uh we'll, we'll replace cash yeah cash with zcash right that's the that's the goal that's the that's the i mean for me like i look at things like zcash and 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 the purpose of it is to mim- is to mimic physical cash and i know there's a lot of 
talk about potential programmability and interoperability within Zcash and porting it across chain. But for me, the core functionality of it just being a digital cache that's that protects my privacy sits in a personal wallet that I can use when I need to. Um, I kind of view it as like, and I don't know if this is a popular uh, perspective on Zcash, but I kind of view it as like cash from, from the 1960s and 70s. Like everyone always had $500 on them. Yeah. And they used it either regularly and always withdrew $500 every week. And they didn't really create any abnormal patterns with their cash use, but or they just had it under the mattress in case in case of a rainy day. And that's kind of how I view Zcash. Like I think everybody should have, let's say you have ten thousand dollars. For me, five hundred of that should be in Zcash. Like a little bit in physical cash, five hundred in Zcash, and then do with do what you want with the rest of it. Um, Isn't it hard I know to that, get... but that's. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I hear you. Isn't it hard to get universal adoption of that though? When you have to to do that, you have to be willing to accept the the higher variability in the value of Zcash than you would with fiat right now. Yeah. So I the the issue, and this is an even longer conversation, and this is probably another rabbit hole we could go on go down. But I view, I don't denominate my crypto in dollars. Okay. I don't when I when I have Zach or Bitcoin or anything else, I I kind of just view it as as that because I understand that there's going to be a number of different cycles that happen. They're going to go up and down like, because, and I think that has a lot to do with the fixed supply cap because there's liquidity shocks. There's a lot of liquidity added then a lot of liquidity removed in these different cycles. Right. Um, and I personally view it as it's going to last another five or six cycles. And then after more mainstream adoption and should Zcash be the thing that wins in the, you know, the, the privacy preserving cash aspect of cryptocurrency and the broader cryptocurrency markets, um, in cryptocurrency space, then once it reaches a market cap to where everyone's using it for that purpose, then I would imagine that the volatility, um, instead of going up 200% and then down 80%, it kind of just hovers between 10 and 15% different uh, deviations. Then you get closer to, you know, the real deviations that happen in, happen in fiat too, that just people don't notice because they don't think about yeah. it. The and that's the oh, that's the interesting yeah. now. People notice now, yeah, with the whole with the whole like uh with the CPI increasing and then and then and then <laughs> perceived inflation. I, I've heard arguments that it's actually not inflation. It's it's even worse. But don't want to dive into. Don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But yeah, no, the CPI how, the CPI is is, is garbage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's I've been listening to a lot of stuff recently on that, like different economists talking about that, and it's just hard to you kind of hear the story that's happening on the news and then you listen to like the economist dive deeper into what actually is going on. And I think what's going on is actually worse. And I hope that it doesn't result in these catastrophic, like um, shortage of commodities and energy price shortage and energy and energy prices skyrocketing and all these different things happening. Um, I hope we don't get to that point where it's like a little bit unbearable. I've heard like in Europe, like something they've said in the EU for the upcoming winter, because they don't know if they're going to have enough, yeah. energy available to heat everyone's homes. They're telling people to potentially wear a sweater in, indoors. And that's really scary because if you've, you're, you know, let's say in your 80s, 90s, and that's not the debt, that's not a situation you want to be in. You want to obviously be in like the comfort of a, a warm home in the winter and yeah. European winter, winters are not, are not tame. So it's. Yeah. During the, it's Texas, a, uh, during the Texas freeze, uh, there were some kids that died. Yeah. Yeah. And it's this, this, it's kind of like this, it, this whole energy unpreparedness that like a lot of different places didn't invest enough into their energy grids to be prepared for a situation where um, a lot of the supply was cut off or supply was restricted. So they're not prepared for the situation. Yeah. And it's, it could potentially be catastrophic. That's and, one of the things where yeah. Bitcoin miners actually help with that. Right. That's a, that's a, t tell me t how, yeah, how, great argument. tell it's, me more about that. That's, uh, I, I am not well versed in that. Yeah. It's just the argument that, um, Bitcoin mining isn't, uh, doesn't depend on, uh, doesn't have energy use following the same pattern that human beings use it. We use it, we, we turn on the lights during the day. We, you know, we, uh, we turn on the, the, I guess the heat at night and we follow regular patterns of Bitcoin miners to just mine it whenever. So they love to use the off peak usage. That's cheaper. 
Um, so they will invest in 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 in, 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 in make it uh, make it affordable for um, the electric grid to grow to a point where when you need the energy for retail people, it's there because the Bitcoin miners have been using it during the off peak hours. Uh, uh, and, and, and they can, you know, they can, and they even voluntarily stop mining during peak hours or during emergency times, at least in Texas. This is a big part of the Texas story. Um, so the environmental issues with Bitcoin are very complicated. The use of renewables, the, uh, the off peak usage as a way to invest in long term energy infrastructure in the electric grid um, are interesting kind of countervailing arguments. It's great. Uh, you should follow. There's a, a woman whose handle is Jen Urso. She copied that from a Star Wars movie. Uh, I forget her real name, but she's um, she's uh, a progressive Bitcoiner. So she makes the progressive case for Bitcoin uh, and very much focused on these energy issues. And she's got she's a great follow on Twitter. So does she run the progressive Bitcoiner podcast? I don't know. I haven't list. I haven't listened to that, but I've yeah. I've actually messaged that. She's, that more, podcast I don't know, so she's a big Monero person. She's a Bitcoin and Monero person, but um, <laughs> but uh, she's uh, is she. I think she was recently on uh, the Monero. Uh, the name of the Monero podcast. Your competitor. Mon- Monero. Uh, Monero talk. Monero talk. Yeah. Monero talk. Yeah. Yeah. So is this wait, is Zcash talk? No, that would be. You need something better than that. You need. Yeah, I don't. I don't the, I, shield, I think I, I, the shield. The, the shielded podcast. The shielded podcast. And it, but we'd have to we'd have to do it with cameras off and, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, right. and dubbed dubbed voices. How with the a lot of so a lot of the talk within like the Bitcoin community, not the Bitcoin. Let's just say like a, a sect of the Bitcoin community, um, saying that Ethereum moving to proof of stake makes it a security. So it's proof of work talk. There's a lot of, you know, FUD from the Ethereum community and broader communities on Bitcoiners saying that, you know, proof of work's bad for the environment. And then you have two arguments in Bitcoin. You have the one where it's like, it's actually good for energy production. And then you have the other that says, it doesn't matter if it's bad for the environment, it's worth it. So those are your two kind of deviations there. And I, you know, if I'm misspeaking, you know, forgive me. And then you have, the other side of the aisle where Bitcoiners are saying, well, proof of stake doesn't make you a currency. It just makes you another you know, form of equity. Could you kind of explain why people might perceive proof of stake as yeah. being more of an equity versus a money? And then, you know, what what a moved what protocols moving from proof of work to proof of stake might mean from a regulatory perspective? Um, so when you're a security, you have to register with the SEC. Uh, you have to fill out 10Ks and 10Qs and stuff like that. You have to follow all kinds of rules that are designed for something with the board of directors, something very centralized, uh, something that um, is very much unlike any crypto protocol. Right? So it, it's, it's a square peg, round hole problem. Now, um, the security definition is um, there's a bunch of different ways to become a security, but the one that's of most of interest to crypto is the Howey test an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit from a promoter or a third party. Um, So in the move to proof of stake, let me step back for one second. I'm giving the the five minute version of my semester long securities class. Um, The other thing about this test is that sometimes courts of the SEC will point to a thing and say that thing is a security. but sometimes, and the, the more formalistic way to think about this test is that it's not so much the thing as a security, but the sale of it is a sale of a security. Like the way you sell it makes it a sale of a security. Like, hey, buy this thing and you'll make money off of it. Can make things that don't really seem like securities nevertheless part of a sale of securities. There's a bunch of examples of that in the securities law, some weird examples. Sale of an interest in chinchillas. Furry little creatures, you know, uh, sale of uh, the original test for this, the sale of uh, interest in an orange grove. Um, so the case for this argument would be that if someone said uh, e- the case for this, ar- even the best, most generous case to the proponents of this argument is not that Ethereum itself is a security and most transactions in Ethereum are security. That's not, or if anybody's making their argument, it's not a credible argument. 
the case for that argument would be that if someone, uh, uh, if a staker, uh, if someone, if the people at Lido, and they don't do this, maybe I shouldn't pick Lido, someone, someone else like Lido, if they started saying, hey, give me some money, give me some Ethereum, uh, give me some money, I'll buy Ethereum, I'll stake it, and you'll make 5% a year, and it'll be great, and then you'll make money on it later when it goes up in value, right? That starts to sound like a sale of a security, and that's possible in the proof-of-stake environment. But that's only if you sell it in a specific way. And hopefully my friends at Lido are smart enough not to do that and focus on the fact that the reason for the snake staking is not even principally the return on the staking is to secure the network as a function in securing the network. Um, so that's the generates case for that. Now, the case against that is that even in, the, even in an instance where a validator was being really stupid and trying to market this like an investment, right, and really increasing their risk in doing that, nobody should do that, even if it still is the case that this is very much unlike some other components of the security. Um, first of all, you have an investment of money, but you have to you have to stake Ethereum, and Ethereum is something that you can use to buy J uh, NFTs, right? You could buy um, all kinds of you buy all kinds of stuff on you can buy uh, Cypherpunk zeros, right? Um, my favorite NFT. So it's how can it be an investment of money when it is money? In a way, uh, in a common enterprise, is that a common enterprise? Uh, it's not as clear because uh, maybe if you put it in Lido, you put it in like a lot of different validators that aren't as connected to each other. It's not a centralized enterprise. Uh, so, you know, it's it's uh, it's a harder case. Um, I think it just it just warns really. Be careful if you're a validator. Be careful in how you market what you do. And don't sound like you're promising anyone a monetary return. Focus more on the fact that this is important, uh, or or don't market it at all. You know, as I, as far as I understand, it yeah. doesn't do marketing. It just kind of relies on us to know what it is and what it does. Um, so that's the risk there. That, that that doesn't make Ethereum a security. That makes it possible that some validators, being careless about how they pitch, staking with them, might meet some of the aspects of how. If they're not careful. That's a, that's, a, that's a really interesting point you just brought up there that you can use Ethereum to buy different things. It, it does seem that Ethereum, along with, I'd say, Solana, Sol, Ether, and Sol, like, are the two, and this is, might be a controversial statement, the two biggest mediums of exchange within within the internet economies. I know stable people use stable coins in different parts of the world, and people use Bitcoin in different parts of the world. But like in terms of this digital economy, where people are buying NFTs and, and buying different um, you know, governance tokens, etc. They're using Ethereum or Ether or Sol as this medium of exchange. So it does kind of fit that model of if, if money is a medium of exchange, then they're both money. That's right. And how could, to the first part of the Howard test, an investment of money, if you're just putting in cash and getting Ethereum, you're trading money for money. That's not an investment of money. It's just trading money for money. It's just a... It's exchanging. A uh, yeah, so that's, you know, I would make two arguments for why the Howey test is different now than it was in 2017 in crypto. The risk is still there. We've got to be careful about the risk. And the risk of the SEC bringing a case against defendants that are, you know, maybe settle, and the case makes the accusation that, like, AMP is a security, and it never really gets adjudicated, that's a real risk in itself. Like, you know, it might be that AMP gets delisted. These, these uh, defendants in the ITK settle, and we never get a final adjudication of whether AMPS is security. But everybody just delists, so they're risk averse. Uh, that is a, is a real danger. But let's talk about the real doctrine, the legal doctrine, and why it's different now, I think, than it was 2017. NFTs have done a real favor to crypto in trying to avoid application of the Howey test because of what you just described. I think what you just intuited, you should take my securities law class because you're thinking like a securities lawyer here. The fact that it's got this demonstrated utility and so many people are using it for the purposes of, of, of buying NFTs and the purposes of gas on Ethereum shows that it's, um, uh, it's not an investment. It's, it's got utility. It's, it's like money and it has a utility kind of function. Um, that helps to avoid the implication that, that these are sales of securities when they're initially distributed or when they're traded on exchange. Um, the other thing that's different is the method of distribution. We've gone away from ICOs and toward airdrops as a way to get tokens out in the community. That's good. 
Because it's hard to say an airdrop is a sale of securities. It's hard to say something is a sale when you're giving it away for free. Um, especially the way airdrops are done now. And there are people in the securities law world who would say an airdrop is a sale of a security. And I think those people are wrong. Those people are dead wrong. The people who say that rely on some old case law where companies would do uh, a spinoff, like a parent company has a subsidiary, let's say, for example, and they want to get rid of it, but they don't want to sell it. They want to distribute it for various tax reasons, distribute it to their shareholders. So the parent company has a sub and they say, you know what? Hey, parent shareholders, you've been great shareholders. We love you. And the executives are also thinking, I have a lot of shares in parent. I'm going to do a distribution of the securities in the subsidiary to parent shareholders, right? I'm going to just spin off the subsidiary to all of my shareholders as a kind of a gift, like a dividend, like a cash dividend, except I'm giving you stock in a subsidiary that I own. That helps the share price, which helps the executives who own shares in the parent, helps everybody who owns shares in the parent. So there were some securities cases which said spinoffs or a sale of a security, and you have to register them, even though you're giving away that stock in the subsidiary for free. And that's what people are relying on to say that airdrops are sales of the security and, and that they are sales. Um, I think that's, that's junk reasoning because um, it's just very different, very different uh, in that one is a centralized company with centralized managers. The other is not. One is used as money to buy NFTs. The other is not. And uh, also that in the spinoff example, you've already accepted that something is stuck. It's already a security because it is stock, so you don't even need to go to the Howey test for investment contracts. So it's all just very different. I think the idea of using that as precedent to say the SEC can go after airdrops is junk. So that's an also a great defense I think we've got. Um, so we're in a different place. There's still a lot of risk, though. I call it Ginsler risk, the risk of uh, all of a sudden Gary saying that's a security, and then all the exchanges say, oh, we got to delist it. And you can still get it on you know, side shift or whatever, but it's not the same right, in terms of getting real liquidity the centralized exchanges do a real service to a lot of to crypto helping to onboard retail and you know don't tell brian armstrong since he retweeted me but i've you know grown in my crypto journey so i'm using using uh dexes a lot more than i would ever use uh, coinbase but <clears throat> but they serve an important role to onboard you know our, our moms and dads and grandparents and stuff i just lost sound i don't know what Can't hear you. What about now? Yeah. Oh, I accidentally muted my mic. Uh, uh, well, it's good because I was. Act I'm, I'm glad you finished a point. I was going to ask you a question about something, but you finished your point, and it actually worked out quite well because this pivot's really useful. I want to move back to the privacy aspect. Mm -hmm. So, broader terms: Zcash, Monero, Coin Joint, uh, Mixers, etc. Um, probably can focus mostly on Zcash, but you're buying crypto on an exchange mm -hmm. and you're in this situation where you have to provide your driver's license, you have to provide, you know, documentation about where you live, et cetera, your address, everything, KYC. What's, why, and then if someone withdraws to their Ethereum address or their Bitcoin address, that address is doxxed, and then they have to go through a number of different things to try to provide some privacy, most of which, like you mentioned earlier with Wasabi, a lot of these different things might not actually work to the level that we want them to. Well, I would say that about Wasabi. Um, I would say, I th from what I can tell, Samurai Wallet, those guys are, are good. Uh, they're, they're good at what they do. So, I'm not Yeah, and 100 percent. <laughs> Do you, but do you think that, so an issue I have a lot with the Bitcoin community is that I don't mind Bitcoin in, it, in its form as a transparent money that acts as somewhat of a reserve asset for different things or acts as a store value in an inflation hedge. I, I don't mind that argument. The thing I struggle with is that Bitcoin privacy can be achieved, especially in the sense that activists and people who need privacy the most can achieve it. Because if there was an actual surveillance mechanism going on within, with, with, these activists and their Bitcoin addresses, they would be found out pretty easily. Um, and if they're actually in the jurisdiction of the country that they're being surveilled in, that can equal some really bad things, as we saw with some of the specific truckers within within the within the Canadian trucker Bitcoin situation. So why why would you why would you use 
if you're looking for privacy, why would anyone ever recommend potentially using a Bitcoin and 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 a samurai wallet? Why why is even why do you think Bitcoiners are so hesitant to say use Monero, use Zcash, etc.? Because the user experience is really difficult and we can't, I don't think we can expect people to be proficient in doing all of this, especially everyday users. And it's just, I'm trying to figure out how we can, um, how we can kind of in increase the conversation around, hey, let's democratize the different tools that we have yeah. in this space and use them for what they're really good at. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a hard question. There's a lot of different options to think about and they're all still nascent. And with respect, even Zcash is, you know, like I love Zcash, but I've got, uh, you know, there's some post orchard issues and I guess there was an attack for a while. So I'm still trying to figure out how to get my Nighthawk to work again. I haven't been able to use it for three weeks. It's scanning. So out. I will, I will, I, my, I will my, message you. I'll message you the okay, fix. My Zec Lite <laughs> is still working, but my, just my Nighthawk app is, it hasn't been working for like three weeks. I don't have a lot. I've just got a couple of seconds there. I mostly keep it in, in the hard wallets, right? Obviously you keep the good stuff there. Although, unfortunately, Ledger doesn't allow shielded, which is a shame. We got to fix that. Um, but yep. um, but my Zek Lite's working great, right? But still, like, there were some post yep. archery issues, but it's growing pains. It's okay. Um, Samurai, as far as I can tell, Samurai is not crackable. And the truckers should have used Samurai, but it's also, it's not easy to use. Like, it's, it's, comp it's complicated and there's a fee associated. And it's only available on a few devices. Sa yeah, Samurai is only available on um on uh on uh, um android uh but sparrow is uh is connected to samurai and you can get that on your desktop um uh but it's you know it's complicated it's not easy to use it's not like you I, like it took me a couple of weeks to figure out you know read through the white papers and really make sure i figured out how to use it which means your average user is never going to use that right so then there's the other question for the bitcoin crowd of uh the limited privacy you get with Bitcoin Lightning, and will that be sufficient? Um, some for some people, we got to admit that it will, right? Because I mean, most people, like unfortunately, most of the world doesn't care about privacy. They give all their info to, you know, all these uh, these centralized um, social media providers, and they just they're glad to be tracked to get the free stuff in exchange. So, the, but big part of the world is going to be comfortable enough with like. The fact that the coffee shop barista can't look up my net worth, but they'll be glad that chain out. They don't care about chain analysis. They won't care. It's just a fact. It's not as good as Zcash or Monero. Um, but I think it'll still be around. I think it'll still be there. But I think that Zcash has a great future ahead. I, I'm a, I'm an owner of some Zcash and, and uh, I'm going to feature them in my book. Um, I think Monero is very different and I'm not an expert. I'm sure Zuko could school me up on some of the flaws in Monero, but um, they seem to really care about getting it right as well. Unlike the crypto coins that have failed, they seem to really be, you know, a dedicated community. So uh, they're an interesting project to watch too, I think. Um, yeah, I, 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 I admittedly don't know a ton about Monero. I've been trying to read up, read, read more up on it. I, I've, I got sent a 175 page document <laughs> and it's called zero to Monero. <laughs> and I'm on page like 50. 50. I read it. I read it when I have some free time, but I mean, I, again, I, do you think that there needs to be more, do you think there needs to be more openness about the shortcomings of different projects? Like for example, do you think that within crypto, it could be perhaps be seen as irresponsible for marketing your project for something that is perhaps not? Like, is it, is it a situation where we just need to lay out the facts instead of trying to perhaps one up everybody and say that we're better, like we're better than X projects because of all these different factors, rather than just saying like, there's trade-offs with that, with all of this stuff. Yeah. It's a little, as a, as an outsider kind of learning about what all of you do. Um, I think the leadership at EZC and, and some of the hardcore Monero devs that I've listened to on Monero's podcast, uh, are responsible and they're like. They're not just throwing fudge at their fudge. They're just they're very careful technical conversations, uh, and that's fine. Into the broader privacy communities, there's a lot of weird kind of tribalism, like there's in the rest of crypto, and and that's not because that doesn't seem very constructive to me. Well, I don't think I don't think the quite like I'm more concerned with this. 
I, like I saw um, a leader in the Bitcoin community call Monero um, Chimerian eCash, I think was the okay. term. Like just kind of just saying it's, it is a garbage project. And again, I don't know a lot about Monero. It seems to be getting a lot of discussion within the Bitcoin community right now. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, are there, why, why do you think that there's um, perhaps hesitancy from other projects to look at things like Zcash and say, you know, they're really good at this privacy thing and people should be using Zcash for privacy. I know Balaji said it in Tim Ferriss's podcast. He, he mentioned that if you really need privacy, you need to use Zcash. And I know there's a ton of other examples that mention that. But why do you think that there's this hesitancy within certain crypto communities to kind of to say that there are these private assets out there and private monies out there that you could use for these situations? Why do they feel like why do they call them shit coins? Essentially, I'm just trying to trying to gather like from from your perspective as a student of, of cryptocurrency, as you mentioned. What do you see as that being that a uh, being yeah, that um, you know it's, it, well, I mean, there's the one aspect, and you know, Zuko talks about this already, so I'm probably just copying in my head what I learned from him when up only, because um, he's got that interesting perspective. Having been there at the beginning, like like people in Vegas talk about how they shook Frank Sinatra's hand, right? Like he shook figuratively shook Satoshi's hand. He was like exchanging communications with this guy. He goes all the way back. Um, you know, it seems like like if Satoshi is dead, like if he came back to life and he looked at like the Bitcoin maxi religion, he would kind of be like, "What? Is, this is weird. What is this?" Right? Everything the guy's written, he was a very objective kind of scientific computer programming guy. Like he wasn't like a Bitcoin maxi. He had a project. He was trying to make it work, but he didn't seem to share any of that ethos. You know, um, he was uh, so uh, I, I don't understand kind of that part of it. That 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 laser eye stuff. Um, it's a it's a great technology. I own a lot of Bitcoin, um, and I love it. <clears throat> I'd love to see what it will continue to do, and I think it's got a bright future in the near term. Um, it's also not something I would pay with. I would would prefer to pay with uh, Zcash Monero when people start taking it, um, and we get more adoption. Um, uh, I also use Samurai to to shield um, to to cut transaction history for Bitcoin. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see more kind of scientific debate uh, and less FUD. Uh, I think that would be useful. You know, what I've seen so far in the critics of Zcash sure. really is like uh, a lot of uninformed stuff. Like like as a before, people that don't like the ceremony or uh, people that think it's corporate somehow um, just because it maybe got seed funding at the very beginning. Um, or like... Which they, which they, which oh, they really? donated. Yeah. <laughs> They, uh, yeah, they they donated all of the. Uh, I believe they donated all of the sh all of the shares. Yeah, that, I mean, shares or seed, like, the seed if money. If there's or, some yeah. problem with the blockchain that's not private or some secret backdoor or something, then find it and tell the world about it. But I've never heard anybody say that. I don't. Yeah, the the fud is the fud. I I think that's a great way to put it. It's uninformed and and it's it's interesting to hear. Um, when I when I'm like on Twitter now that sometimes people kind of figure out I work I work at ECC and work on Zcash they they throw stuff at me sometimes and I'm like like I I've I've heard this I've heard this a hundred times I've 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 read all of the criticisms before I started working on it I wanted to kind of know what I was getting yeah. into right like you want to hear from every side it's, yeah, yeah it's the one bit, thing I've heard that, that seems to stick is just that you know historically use of shielded was low so you had to kind of lower anonymity set because of low usage which is not really a critique it's just that. We need to get more people to use shielded transactions. Now they're shielded by default, so that would naturally start to happen anyway. Um, and mm -hmm. it's a problem that with with the wallets, they're shielded by default. With if you have a shielded, yeah, yeah shielded. So wallet. that's going to help, and that's just that's that's a legit problem to, to point out. But it's fixable with more adoption. Right? If if someone if someone you know is new to crypto and and they're Pick it, they're at a book signing. They're picking up your book, and and they're gonna they have they get to ask you a question, and they ask, you know, I'm new to all this, and I wanna I wanna maintain some privacy. I've heard that Bitcoin's not private. I've heard that Ethereum, etc. What advice would you give them? Um, that's an interesting question. Kind of depends on for what purpose they're going to be using the crypto. Are they doing DeFi? Uh, are they uh, doing retail payments? Are they are they doing they, something a little naughty? <laughs> you know, it depends. 
let's let's put it this way they uh they want to buy and send some crypto between their okay friends. they want to get some crypto and they want to send it they want to instead of using venmo they want to use crypto and they know that it'll be treated as a capital gains transaction and they don't want to be surveilled about that maybe which is perfectly legitimate to me i mean it's because i yeah. think it's even 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 without the capital gains yeah. caveat, yeah, yeah, they, just they don't want to be. Yes, and we don't. Yeah. We're not going to ask why. Um, Let's say they're super yeah, libertarian, yeah, like me. Like me. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say. Uh, um, look, there's no easy answer right now because everything's a little bit uh, nascent and complex, and. Um, but yeah, I would say uh, you know I would say you see cash Monero. I mean, if you put if you had to make me choose, I'd say those are two great privacy coins. I would say use them. Easy cash. M &M. <laughs> <laughs> heresy. Uh, do I you know, think but it's I'm, worth I'm trying to, uh, Heresy, heresy. You're, you're, the Bitcoiners are not going to speak to well, you anymore after that. Uh, do you think there's... But there's an interesting thing where Peter, McCorm Peter McCormick was talking to Seth uh, for privacy yeah. from Monero. He's and got a great, great podcast. I think... He does. He's, he's brilliant. But Peter was trying to decipher how to potentially acquire private Bitcoin with Monero. And Seth brought up this great, this great point where you really shouldn't use, and he mentions Zcash in this, you shouldn't use Monero, Zcash, any privacy currency as a pass-through. And I think that's a big misconception yeah, that people have. Let's it's talk like, oh, I'm going to buy it. Yeah, I, I'm going to, let's, so how, how do you, do you explain that yeah. in your book? Do you say, okay, let's say I'm going to buy Zcash. I want to get it to an undox Ethereum wallet. So I'm going to buy Zcash, run a couple shielded transactions yeah. with it, and use side shift to get it, and then use side side shift to get Ethereum. Like, is this tell explain a little bit more of why that doesn't work? And, and yeah, well, there's at least uh, I'm still figuring out how to categorize this, but there's at least two types of privacy: uh, asset privacy, asset shielding, and transaction shielding. And they're very different. Um, asset shielding is a lot easier hide something somewhere. Um, and the rule of good asset shielding is, just like the rule of hide and go seek, hide and stay hidden. Don't poke up your head and look around, right? The more you keep moving around, the more at risk you are. Uh, hide and stay hidden. So privacy is in part a function of time, the ability to, uh, and that doesn't mean it has to stay hidden forever, uh, but the, the shielding transaction and the unshielding transaction can be linked together. And time is one of the functions that makes it easier to link them statistically. Uh, and to the extent that people have like, I think there was one example of somebody that, uh, that uh, kind of a silly story, but you guys will know it better, right? Wasn't it on Twitter? He said like, oh, I just shielded something. Uh, you guys can find it out. And somebody else was like, I found it because he had literally like shielded and unshielded it like, it, like the same day or something like that. It's the poor use mm -hmm. of this great yeah. technology, right? Um, so that doesn't work. Uh, so if you're one way to think about that, although it's, it's not perfect is think about it like a checking account. And, and if you want to spend it, you, you know, you put it in and you leave it in for a few months and then you make sure you don't spend it in the same denominations that it went in. Uh, but just the more time between the shielding and the unshielding, the better, I think there's probably more sophisticated statistics behind how to think about that risk, but I mean, just generally speaking, I think the more time between the shielding transaction and the unshielding transaction, the better. And the idea that you're just going to do it immediately, contemporaneously, it doesn't help you at all, really, I think. So you kind of have to go into the privacy, like, okay, I'm going to purchase private cryptocurrency. You kind of have to go into that, into that, into that situation with the mindset, I've, I'm going to hold on to this for a relatively long amount of time before I even ever use it to maintain this maximum amount or because there's no such thing as perfect privacy, but you still want to maintain like a, for scoring it out of a hundred, like that's you want right. to get an eight that's plus, right. Right? That's you want to get a That's going to be true. That the one caveat is if we ever get to a world of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, pri of, of more peer to peer privacy transactions of more native privacy economic ecosystem, that's less of a problem. Um, uh, that you, you that you're buying stuff from the merchant, and you both have shielded addresses. Um, that's less of an issue there. And you, but I think a caveat there is that you still have to be, you have to be 
aware that right, the sure. merchant, yeah, the merchant might might de-shield their might de-shield theirs. So it's kind of this weird thing of like, okay, you you always it's like it's like using cash, right? If you're going to go buy something with cash and you maybe you don't want people to know what you're buying with cash, you shouldn't go to the ATM, take out the exact amount of money you're going to spend, right. and then go buy something. You should go take out money three months earlier and you take out more than you're going to need to use and then just use it as as you need to right it's kind of that same like i like i mentioned earlier it's kind of like you're literally using zcash as as you would physical cash you don't want to create patterns that can be in some way that's traced right. or surveilled and that's one of the one of the chief ways people do uh forensic accounting investigations and in like um like in divorce court you know the husband's hiding money from the divorce court but what you do is you look at um, uh, a net worth analysis and you, or, or a net transaction analysis. You should try to try to match up money moving in different directions and try to see you spent more than it seems like your income suggested you could spend. So there's some money. There's a hole of money that we can infer exists indirectly. Same kind of analysis looking at the pre-shielding and the post-shielding is, uh, is going to be possible. Um, and the more time there is between those two and the more randomness there is in the numbers that come in and out, uh, probably the better. We're we're coming up on an hour and, and obviously it's getting a, getting later in tonight. So I want to ask okay. one last question around the Crypto Freedom Lab. You discussed it a little bit earlier about it being similar to Coin Center and taking on a lot of the lawsuits that they might uh, they might not take on. Tell could you tell everyone a little bit more about the inspiration for this project? You're taking donations in three specific currencies. And I wonder if those currencies in any way inspired you to do this project and just want to learn a little bit more and where people can find that. Yeah, uh, CryptoFreedomLab.com. Uh, this is a little think tank I am setting up and um, getting, starting to raise some money for. Uh, the idea is to do a couple things here. The idea is first to fight for crypto, fight for crypto freedom. That means being ready to stand up to regulators, being ready to sue regulators. Um, I've got the law firms lined up and ready to go uh, to challenge final challenges against the SEC in their overreach uh, and against the banking regulators if we need to uh, in other aspects as well, uh, because you need to stick uh, with the regulators. You need to make them know that, that you know, if you're rattling the saber, you have to actually have a saber and be willing to use it. And then a lot of the day to day will be comment letters to agencies when they do rules to say, look, if you do this rule this way, I'm going to sue you. And you have to be able to credibly back up that threat. Uh, but comment letters can move the needle in a pro-freedom, pro-innovation, pro-privacy direction. So we'll do a lot of that. Uh, and then uh, outreach uh, in the policy sphere more broadly, in Congress especially, and be a voice for the user, be, be a voice for privacy. Uh, there are a lot of great advocates for crypto in D.C., Blockchain Association, Coin Center. But uh, we're going to be more of a retail-based, user-based voice. Um, and uh, uh, sponsor original academic research that can buttress our policy work uh, and make the point that the SEC is ahead of its skis in terms of the do evolution of the securities law doctrine over the last 75 years. Uh, make the point that <coughs> crypto finance is in many ways safer and presents less of a systemic risk than traditional finance. Help people who are doing some innovative work that I'd love to work with, that I, I will work with if I have the money to support doing some innovative work on changing the Uniform Commercial Code to make it easier to use NFTs. Um, this is going to be even cooler than 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 Bored Apes. Uh, use NFTs to memorialize and securitize transactions and physical goods, which sounds boring. But if we can do that, that's trillion dollars worth of value in, in crypto. If we can find ways to securitize an interest in leased cars and leased boats and uh, kind of connect to the Internet of Things, but securitize the transaction using the chain rather than the old UCC filing system that the states have. So anyway, there's a scholar that's working with the Uniform Commercial Code um, <clears throat> group that I'd love to work with on that. Um, and and, and pro-privacy, privacy, obviously fighting the good fight uh, that, 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 that Coin Center has led for a long time uh, against the third-party doctrine and against other overreach um, on AML, BSA, and, and financial surveillance generally. Um, yeah, so that's the that's the goal. You know, I want to sue regulators. Uh, and sometimes it's hard because the DeFi protocols who'd be in the great position to sue all tell me the same thing. They say, 
I don't want to be the one to poke my head up because, uh, you know, if I challenge the SEC rule, I'm going to be the first person they sue. Um, so that's fine. Gift to my think tank anonymously, and I'll sue. I love to sue the SEC. Um, uh, they don't scare me. I've, I've gone toe-to-toe with them more than a few times. Uh, so that's the goal with the, with the, with the um, uh, Crypto Freedom Lab. And thanks for, thanks for bringing that up, Ian. Yeah, of course. And as we wrap up here, is there anything I may have forgot to ask you that you'd want to discuss or? Um, no, I mean, we had a pretty good free ranging conversation. Uh, like I said, I'm still a student of crypto. I'm still learning. So if your listeners are like, man, that guy said something really frustrating. He's so wrong. Just reach out to me on Twitter and I'd love to talk more with you about that and, and, uh, and learn from you guys in the Zcash community. Yeah, this is a, this is yeah, obviously it's the first episode. So it's really about kind of trying to build that, not even build like a listener base. I mean, it's just trying to, you know, get the, get, get these conversations out there within the privacy space. Like I know Monero talks doing a great job. Stuff for privacy is doing a great job. You know, having someone from Zcash, I don't know if that person should be me for the long term. I think, I think it should be a, like the community should be doing it um, and, and work and can work on this and try to inspire some community members to take something like this over. Um, but more conversations around these topics are like super important. And yeah, I just think, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the same. I'm learning so much every day. Like I, I go into, and I get to talk with some of the most brilliant people in this industry every day at work. And you kind of have to start accepting that you're constantly wrong. And that's something I'm learning and, and it's really humbling, but just being, being okay and being comfortable with constantly being wrong about things. And that's a very yeah. harsh way to put it, but always being willing to learn and, and kind of like the proof of work versus proof of stake. I came into ECC, like, you know, not really knowing anything about proof of stake and kind of listening to a lot of the FUD going around it. And then just speaking with a couple of the people researching it has really opened up my eyes. And I'm like, oh, this is actually a really interesting way to look at, you know, interoperability yeah, and security yeah, and the future of, had the, great, future of the protocol. Uh, great, some great points about economies of scale, which is, um, uh, yeah. It's, uh, he sounds a little more like an economist than an engineer. He's got a little bit of both in him, but uh, yeah, <laughs> he's a brilliant guy. Um, yeah, that's fun, man. It's okay. it's fun. Awesome. It's fun to learn about these uh, communities, and, and you know, so different. Um, Zcash and Monero communities so different, and yet they've got so much more in common than they have with the rest of the world. Um, I wish they got along a little better. You know, it's kind of very different. Monero's kind of time tested in the online drug markets. I mean, let's be honest; it's a big use of Monero. But that helps to kind of battle test them in a way. On the other hand, Zcash community, very much grounded in the academic, scientific uh, community and and going back to the original cypherpunks and kind of taking up the mantle of crypto privacy in a way that Bitcoin failed us at. Um, it's such such a cool story. And and uh, I hope to tell it because I think a lot of people will, be, For sure. will want to learn about awesome. your story. Something happened here. We actually stopped recording, I think. It kicked, kicked us off. It tells me it's still recording. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? What it says, what it tells me about you is that actual recording is higher quality, which it, it does look higher quality than before. But I don't know. Well, I, I just started, uh, I think, we're, yeah, I think we're still recording, but I, I can figure out a way to like edit the, yeah. Yeah. So, where where we left off? Okay, the Monero and yeah, I guess we're we're recording. Yeah, well, it's good luck for yeah podcasts. yeah, it's and I hope this uh, yeah, I hope this works. Issues. Oh, it's uploading right now, so now it's recording a new thing. It must have a time limit on it because I didn't get the paid version. I'm just testing this Riverside thing out. Um, Zoom's probably the most reliable, but this like this had some good YouTube ads, so I checked it out. But yeah, so we we left off. I guess I can add this part to it as well. I mean, it's recording, so we left off with. Uh, Monero and Zcash hating each other, but having more in common than, than they might, than they might think. Awesome. Well, JW, yeah. thank you so thank much you. for your time this evening. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, man. Uh, good yeah, following and, you on and Twitter. Where can people let's, find let's, you let's on Twitter? Stay in touch. Uh, so at JW Verrett, uh, and then, um, CryptoFreedomLab.com, and, um, you know, from there, you'll find links. And all of those links will be in the description of this video. So awesome. Thanks for your time, JW.